بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلي وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد باب الصلاة المريض The prayer of the sick Now, there are five conditions of a sick person. Number one is they're unable to stand, but it is possible for them to make the ruku and sujood while sitting down. Number two is they're not able to stand or perform ruku and sujood while sitting down. Uh, number three, they're not able to sit they have to lay down but they can actually perform the ruku and sujood through gestures of the head number four is the condition in which they are unable to sit so they have to be kept laying down and number f and they can't even make uh ruku or sujood through these gestures as well and number five is that they can stand the, the maris the sick person can stand but he or she is unable to perform ruku and sujood right so these, these are the five ahwal or the five scenarios in which the maras or the sickness of a person may manifest, and each of them have their own couple. إذا تعذر على المريض القيام صلى قاعدا يرقع ويجد. So this is the first condition in which it's not possible for the maris to actually stand. If it's impossible for the sick person to stand, they're going to pray while sitting down and they're going to perform the ruku and sujood. That is, we know this because of a hadith mentioned in Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to in Ran ibn Hussein radiallahu alhumma. صلي قائما فإن لم تستطيع فقاعدا فإن لم تستطيع فعلى الجنب تؤمن إيمان that pray while you are standing and if that's not possible then pray while you are sitting down and if that too is not possible then pray, pray while lying on your side and making gestures if you have to and the reason why is like in part of a hadith mentioned in Sunan al -Nasai, the Prophet Islam mentioned after this, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها that Allah does not ask someone to do something more than which they can bear. I, any taklif, any hukum by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tied to the taqa and the wus of that person, their ability to perform something. And if they don't have that ability, uh, they're not asked by the Sharia to do something. So if it's not possible for you to stand, you might as well sit down. And if you can't even do that, uh, you can lie down as well. The second condition, فَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَطِعَ الرُّقُوعَ وَالسُّجُودِ If the person cannot perform the ruku and sujood, right? neither can they stand. Then they are going to, while they're sitting down, perform the ruku and sujood through gestures, right? But obviously, you have to differentiate between the gestures of the ruku and sujood. How will you do that? You're going to make the gesture of the sajda lower than the gesture of the ruku. So if you're 
tilting your head 30 degrees for your rupu, do it 40 degrees for your sajda. Right? Uh, because in this case, this bowing of the head uh, is a substitute for both of them. And so it's going to take the same problem as both the ruku and the sujood. And when you pray normally, you would bend more in your sujood than you would in your ruku. Right? Uh, the same hadith of the Prophet Islam, in qadarta an tasjud al arzi fasjud, that if it is possible for you to make the sajda on the ground, then do so. Wa illa fa'awmi bi rasik. And if not possible, then just make a gesture of your head. And remember, making the gesture of the head is necessary. If you lift something up and place it on your forehead, that would not count as a sajda. So you can't raise a board or a book or a pillow and without tilting your head, just touch it on your forehead. That will not act as a substitute for making the sajda there should be a gesture of the head involved. Third condition, وَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَطِعَ الْقُعُودِ If a person is unable to sit down, إِسْتَلْقَ عَلَى ظَهْرِهِ أَوْ إِسْتَلْقَ عَلَى قَفَاهُ Then they're going to lie down straight on their back. وَجَعَلَ رِجْلَيْهِ إِلَى الْقِبْلَى And they're going to Place their feet facing towards the Qibla. And they're going to perform gestures for the Ruku and Sujood. Right? The hadith of Imr ibn Hussain, in which the Prophet said, If you can't sit down, they're on your back and making gestures. So the question to ask is, uh, is it necessary that you lie on your back? Is it possible to lie in some other position? Or you could phrase it as, what if someone is unable to lie on their back for some reason? Can they lie in some other manner? The answer to that is yes. If a person is laying on their side in such a manner that their face is facing towards the Qibla. So either you're on your left or right, depending on how your bed is positioned or how you are on bed laying down. If your face is towards the Qibla, Jaza, the Salah is also permissible in this case as well because of the Hadith that we've mentioned a few times just now. Uh, except the fact that, remember, lying on your back with your feet towards the Qibla and face to, facing towards the Qibla in such a manner is awla and afwa. It's the better way to do so. But if you can't, uh, don't force yourself. Uh, you can lie on your side and face the Qibla and perform your salah as well. Condition number four, in which even making gestures for someone is impossible. Maybe they're in a state of paralysis. Yes. So in lam yasati al ima, if they can't even perform gestures, then the whole salah will be delayed. Right? Uh, they're going to delay their salah for the time being because if you can't even make gestures of the head, you basically can't do anything, right? Uh, uh, you can't just make gestures with your eyes or imagine yourself praying with your heart or with your eyebrows, right? Because these things are like making substitutes for something. That is something that we cannot do based on our own opinion. Like the only way we know that the making gestures can act as a substitute for ruku and sujood is through the hadith of the Prophet salam, right? And the hadith mentions it to the extent of making gestures with your head if for some reason you cannot perform the ruku and sujood. And it ends over there. 
So if a person is also unable to make gestures with their heads, they can't even tilt it. You cannot, by your own chaos, your own logic, come to this conclusion that, well, if not the entire head, a part of it should suffice. Maybe my eyebrows or just my eyes. And if I can't do it with my outer physical body, then my imagination and my tasawwur of performing the salah should suffice, right? That's not going to work. That's not how it works. Our logic has no dakhal and no involvement, especially when it involves numbers and also when it involves telling us what can act as a substitute for another action, right? And so the key word here to notice is that the salah will be delayed. It's not going to, uh, the wujub of the salah or the requirement is not going to be excused altogether. So once a person does recover, uh, they will be asked to make up for their salah. Right? But this is as long as that person is fully aware of what's happening. Like they're not in a coma or something like that. So that was the end of the first discussion in which discussed the five different ahwal and five different scenarios in which maras or disease and sickness can manifest in relation to the salah. Now let's talk about al sani about the maraz itself. Maraz and siha, both sickness and health. The start and the continuance. I will talk about those cases in which a person either starts their prayer in a state of health or in a state of sickness. And then during the salah, they shift from health to sickness or sickness to health. How will this affect their overall prayer and what are the things that they need to do if faced with such a situation? So number one, we'll talk about a person who was in a state of health, but during prayer, they got sick. Uh, if a person in healthy conditions they prayed some part of their salah. Then during the salah, uh, they get sick to the point that they can't stand. That person is going to complete their salah while sitting down and performing ruku and sujood, if that is possible. And if they're more sick than that, they can't even perform the ruku and sujood, then they're going to make gestures while lying down. Or gestures while sitting down, if they can't just perform the ruku and sujood. And if they can't even sit down, then they're going to lie on their backs and perform the ruku and sujood through the gestures. Yes. So that's number one. Number two is a person initially began their prayer while they were in a state of uh, sickness. And then during salah, they regained their health. Right? If someone is praying, they started praying while they were sitting down. But this is the case in which they are performing the complete ruku and sujood. Thumma saha, and then they regain their health enough to be able to scan. Bana ala salatihi qa'iman. They're going to continue that same prayer and they're just going to stand up because now they're able to do so. Right? 
But if they initially started their prayer being so sick that they were unable to perform the ruku and sujood initially, if some part of their prayer they began while they were making gestures, summa qadra ala ruku'i wa sujood, and then they gained the ability, they gained enough health to be able to perform the ruku and sujood properly, even though they may not have regained enough health to be able to stand completely. Yes, but they can do so, uh, they can perform the ruku and the sujood. Ista'nafa, a salat, they're going to redo the prayer. I started from the very beginning, right? So there's this general principle that is that underlines different ahkam, especially in Kitab al-Salah, is that az-za'if la yabni ala al-qawi, or sorry, is that al-qawi la yabni ala al-za'if, but the za'if yabni ala al-qawi, is something that is in a weak state, can be built upon something on a stronger state. For example, someone who initially was able to pray while they were standing and performing the complete ruku and sujood, right? So their basis, their foundation is a stronger state. If they get sick, they can build their salah, next part of their salah on this strong foundation. Meaning that if they became so sick, they were unable to stand or even perform the ruku and sujood entirely. They have to do gestures for that. They can build their salah on that initial foundation. But something strong cannot be built on a weak foundation. I, in other words, if you start off your salah while you were making gestures for the ruku and sujood, so this is a weak foundation, a weak salah. But during that period, you get enough health to be able to perform the ruku and sujood completely, right? So you cannot build a strong, stronger salah on that weak foundation. You're going to have to restart the salah entirely. And this is when you gain the ability to perform the ruku and sujood. That is, you're going to restart uh, your salah. وَمَنْ أُغْمِ عَلَيْهِ خَمْسُ صَلَوَاتٍ فَمَا دُونَهَا قَضَاهَا uh, well, before we discuss this next masala within Quduri itself, there's a few other masala that we need to know in this chapter, which are mentioned in the other books. For example, one masala is if a person, for example, Number fifth was in Qadra al al Qiyam. If a person is able to stand, walam yaqdir al ruku wa sujood, but they're unable to actually perform the ruku and sujood. Like old people, for example, uh, they can't actually bend, right? In order to some can bend in order to go to the ruku, but they can't perform sajda because of weak knees and whatnot, right? So in a scenario in which a person can stand but they can't perform. Uh, ruku or they can't perform sujood or at the very minimum they can't perform the sujood right uh, the general opinion within the Hanafi madhab in which most diarul ifta give the fatwa is that lam yalzam hul qiyam in the case you can't perform your ruku and sujood standing is not necessary so in other words Qiyam is not an obligation in itself. It is an, only an obligation because it acts as a means to an end. It acts as a means to be able to perform the ruku and sujood. Right? But some of the Diyarifna say that no, that the Qiyam in itself is a separate ruku, it's a separate farz. 
which means that if a person is unable to perform the ruku and sujood, but they can perform the qiyam, that it is faraz upon them that they do perform the qiyam. You cannot be excused from qiyam if you cannot perform the ruku and sujood because that is a wajib all in itself. Remember, this is where the farz and wajib salawat because everybody agrees in nafil salah, even though you do have the ability to stand, you can choose not to, right? So the safe option is if a person can stand, even though they cannot perform ruku and sujood, they should. But if they don't, we're not going to say that your salah is void because again, that's an opinion within the madhab that allows them not to stand if they choose to. Right? Now I'm going to talk about some issues that a different type of maras, right? Waban Talking about some different kinds of conditions, not exactly maras. Uh, we're going to talk about igma, junoon, and no. What is the hukum of the salah of a person who has passed out? Or a person who's gone insane, or for example, if they're sleeping, right? If someone uh, has passed out <coughs> uh, for five salawat or less. Khamsu salawat, fama dunaha. Five salawat or less. Qazaha ida saha. When they regain consciousness, they're going to make the qaza for all of the salawat that they've missed at this point in time. Wa in kana akthar min dalik. But it's more than five prayers. If it's six or more, lam yakzi, then there's no need to make qaza for those salawat. Right. Uh, you might say once an entire time frame for a salah has passed away, even if it's just one single salah, there should be no qaza on it. Because in order for salah to become wajib on a person, they must be able to actually understand uh, khitab Allah ta'ala. They should be aware of the change in timing and the change in coming of a new salah and a salah becoming wajib on them. But if they're in a coma, they're passed out, they can't understand all of this. So they should not be able to, or they should not be required to pray even or make qaza of even a single salah whose entire time has elapsed, right? But the reason is that if it's a few salawat, it's not that difficult to actually make qaza for them. And so because it's an important juz of a mu'min's life, of a Muslim's life, qaza will be made. But if it's a lot of prayers, and a lot over here is determined by an entire day, a five salawat, then because there's a lot of haraj in making those prayers, that is why it is exempted. Uh, similarly, for a woman, for example, in her periods, she is not required to make the qaza of the salawat because uh, her hayd is going to last more than a day, three days, the minimum, right? And so making qaza of so many salawat is haraj. Uh, it puts a person in a difficult situation, right? And so that's why the sharia gives them the exemption. And so is the case over here. If your condition of unconsciousness exceeds one day, you get that uh, option or that excuse of not making the qaza. If it's anything less than that, because there's not haraj in it, there's not extreme difficulty in it, uh, you won't be given an exemption. Uh, a insanity, losing a sanity is the same as having passed out. If it's less than five salawat, you have to make qaza. If it's more than five salawat, you're exempted. 
النوم ليس بعذر sleeping is not an excuse right like natural sleeping even if it for example someone sleeps for 12 hours straight or let's say if they're really good at it they sleep throughout 24 hours five salawat let's they even missed the sixth for example why they were sleeping not having been unconscious for some other reason just sleeping uh, they're gonna have to make puzzle for all of that so sleeping is not an order in the sense that uh, salah in it in its entirety is removed from that person the wajib of the salah it remains Now we have a discussion not mentioned in Mukhtasar al-Quduri, but this is something that can happen. Uh, we're going to talk about things that are not exactly uh, sickness and disease, but they're kind of a sickness. Uh, so examples, if someone starts their prayer, their nafil prayer, while they were standing, and Nafil, remember, whenever we talk about the ahkam of salah, uh, sunnah are included within the Nafil, except sunnah al-fajr. That is something that is near wajib, so it takes the ahkam of the wajib. But as for the other sunnah are concerned, uh, they are just like the nawafil prayer, so they share the ahkam. So someone who starts off their Nafil prayer, their tatawwa, while standing, but during that prayer, they get tired. So if you're doing like a five-day taraweeh session, right? So the qiyam is going to be very long each day. And so you start while you are standing, but you get tired. Uh, so it's okay if you actually take support from something. For example, if you take support on a stick, a staff, or maybe the wall, or even sit down entirely. All of this is acceptable. Right? Uh, because being tired uh, in nafil salah is an udur, it's an excuse, right? And if someone were to actually take support of the wall or a staff or stick outside nafil prayer, in forest prayer, or without any udur, it would have been makru. I mean, the salah won't be void, but it is makru to do so. But if you have an excuse, for example, being tired, uh, so your salah is completely acceptable without any karaha to it. And also, for example, man salah fi safina qaidan. If someone, for example, is traveling by sea, so a lot of people who are not used to traveling by sea, uh, they get seasickness because of the constant motion of the ship, right? The rocking of the ship, it causes a nauseating feeling, right? So if you're traveling by sea in a ship, uh, and if you choose to pray, even if you're not at that moment having headaches, feeling nauseous, you start your prayer off, whether it's faraz or nafil, while sitting down. According to Ma'abu Hanifa, your salah is acceptable, even though it would have been better if you were standing. Right? The reason why he says that, he says that the rocking of the boat or headaches and seasickness while you're at sea is something that is almost certain especially for new travelers. And so something that is certain, al-mutahakkat, that a ghalib al that is kal mutahakkat. What is certain to happen is like, is it has happened. So if you're certain that someone's going to get sick, then it's the same as actually being sick. 
right? Not in every case, but in uh, the case of Salah, for example. And so Imam Hunifa says that it is acceptable, your prayer, better to stand, while the rest of the Imma, including the Sahibain from the Hanafi, Thiq, and the other Imma, for example, Imam Malik Shafi and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, they say that you're not allowed to sit down unless you actually have the uzur, unless you're actually sick, unless you actually have seasickness or the headaches or the nauseating feeling. Unless you don't, uh, you cannot pray while sitting down. The Farah Salah, which we're talking about right now. 